Y'all get up and look at the crowd and show up. Look at everybody. They all look good. Tell somebody looking good. Well, tell somebody doing the best they can. How about that? Tell somebody you're just looking. How about that? <laughs> Ain't God good? First of all, yes, it's Father's Day. One of the greatest things that a father can do is to take his child and go all the way through high school and see them make it to the other side of high school. It's a celebration and a we finally done it. Let's see here. Wanted to call up Thompson. Oh, it's not Thompson. We don't call it Thompson. <laughs> Isn't God good? All the time. It says dream big, never stop learning. Dream big, never stop learning. All of them. Come up here, girl. We shocked you, didn't we? Surprised you. The Thompson Chain Reference Bible. You done so good, girl. Give her a hand clap. And now, who wants to get to where you're at? Yes. Well, how come it when you hold it? It doesn't work when I hold it. It's Father's Day. <laughs> okay. So that, that's supposed to explain that. Yes. Anyway, the um, Christian Women's Fellowship has a couple things I'd like to share this morning. And one of them is this pretty little meeting thing that um, that, that Hazel handed me. <laughs> and we're going to hope that he gets through it. Um, it is not something I write. It is something that I could have wrote because it, it is like, epitomizes every good father and grandfather and and husband, for that matter, that is a good father. But anyway, here goes. Grandpa, some 90 plus years, sat feebly on the patio bench. He didn't move. He just sat with his head down, staring at his hands. When I sat down beside him, he didn't acknowledge my presence. And the longer I sat, I wondered if he was okay. Finally, not really wanting to disturb him, but wanting to check on him at the same time, I asked him if he was okay. He raised his head and looked at me and smiled. Yes, I'm fine. Thank you for asking, he said in a clear, strong voice. I didn't mean to disturb you, Grandpa, but you were just sitting there staring at your hands, and I wanted to make sure that you were okay. Have you ever looked at your hands, he asked. I mean, really looked at your hands? I slowly opened my hands and stared down at them. I turned them over, palms up and then palms down, no, I guess I'd never really looked at my hands as I tried to figure out the point he was making. Grandpa smiled and related this story. Stop and think for a moment about the hands you have, how they have served you well throughout your years. These hands, though wrinkled and shriveled, and weak, had been the tools I have used all my life to reach out and grab and embrace life. They put food in my mouth and clothes on my back. As a child, my mother taught me to fold them in prayer. They tied my shoes and pulled on my boots. They have been dirty, scraped and raw, swollen and bent. They were uneasy and clumsy when I tried to hold my newborn son. They decorated with my wedding band. They showed the world that I was married and loved someone special. They trembled and shook when I buried my parents and spouse and walk my daughter down the aisle. They have covered my face, combed my hair, and washed and cleansed the rest of my body. They have been sticky and wet, bent and broken, dry and raw. And to this day, when not much of anything else of me works really well, these hands hold me up. They lay me down and again continue to fold in prayer. These hands are the mark of where I've been and the ruggedness of my life. But more importantly, it will be these hands that God will reach out and take when he leads me home. And with my hands, he will lift me to his side, and there I will use these hands to touch the face of Christ. I will never look at my hands the same again. But I remember when God reached out and took my grandpa's hands and led him home. When my hands are hurt or sore, I thank you, Grandpa, and I know that he has stroked and caressed and held the hands of God, 
and I too want to touch the face of God and feel his hands upon my face, to feel the love in our Father's hands. And now I'm going to have some help from a couple members of the CFW, CWF, I just said it wrong, because <laughs> um, we have a little gift for all of our fathers today, so that they can use their hands. And Hazel says, once you get this, we're setting up a church work day. <laughs> <laughs> work day on the way. Work day on the way. Did you get one? I was going to say. That's what I was just looking for. No, I don't want to be like that hot. I want to see what's inside of it. That's what I was looking for. There you go. Yeah. Nothing can be. Put your hand in. Snack work day. Is that what it says? Snack work day? Snack work day. Well, yeah, if you want a work day, they don't have a steak outside. <laughs> Coupon for a steak in there, that's a work day. And that too, for dessert. Uh, every, every man stands up. Every man. Every man. Ladies, let's give all these men. Whether you birth a child or not, if you have any, if you got your influence, you're a father. Amen. You can sit down. The hardest job you'll ever love. I, I, I just keep remembering, I, I think about it all the time. It made me so mad when it first happened. I honestly was the maddest I'd ever been with my kids, ever. Now I just laugh at it. I was, my mother was, my mother had, had uh, was in, in the hospital. She was actually uh, on, on, on the way out. But my daddy told me to help her because uh, they had given her their own medicine and she had gone out of her mind. And so, uh, Beverly, and I went up to see my mother, and while we're up there, I get a call from a young lady that had been, that had been at Benson with us, she was spending the weekend with us, she says, she said, uh, uh, Brother David, I think y'all can come home. And I said, why should I come home? She said, because the law, the, the law is surrounding your house. And I said, why is the law surrounding my house? I said, well, D.C. and Daniel. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, what did they do? They were supposed to be down the block somewhere playing for a party. Him and his brother were playing guitars for a party down the block at the end of the colder side where nobody could hear them. And they said, well, I don't know what happened, but they brought the music in the backyard at the parsonage, and they're playing, and they've got about 100 plus 100 to 200 people out here. And they're jamming and they're having a ball and somebody called the law and now the law is getting to break up and D.C. sitting outside talking junk to the law. <laughs> and so I, I told my mama, I said, I'll be back eventually, mama. I said, if I want to go to jail first, I know I had to go to the hospital, I don't know. And I went home and by the time I got home, they were just breaking everything up. And I said, why did you not do what you said you were going to do and play in the colder side? They said, well, Daddy, because they got so many people out there, there was not enough room. So we figured the parsonage had plenty of room. I said, but do you realize we've got neighbors all around us? They said they all loved it. They were out there raising their hands and having a good time, too. I said, well, somebody did. And, and I said, the worst of all, D.C., you talk junk to the law constantly. You wouldn't be quiet. And so the next day we had to get, we were dedicating Bethany. We had just adopted, we were dedicating Bethany. And we got a picture, and D.C. and Daniel look like the Cole Haynes. They're so upset. Because I told them that night, I said, boys, y'all just need to go to bed. Because if there ever come a chance I can come close to killing you this tonight. <laughs> and they said, but Daddy, I said, what Daddy mean? Just go to bed so nobody gets hurt. Their mama said, calm down, Dad. I said, there's no need to be calm. The law's out here. The all this stuff's going on. Go to bed before I, and I literally said it, before I kill you. D.C. looking at shaking his head. I said, before I kill you. The next morning at church, they're just like this, and they went to their grandmama, and their grandmama came to me and said, they want to come home with me today. <laughs> and she said, he said the craziest thing, D.C. I said, he's always saying crazy things. He's like his mom. <laughs> yeah. And he said, he said, he said, you're going to kill them. They need to go home with me because you're going to kill them. And I said, well, I weren't really going to kill them. I just wanted to last night, but I've calmed down. I'm just going to maim them. <laughs> so they're still playing and still having a good time, but, but praise God, fatherhood and motherhood both is really hard. Because 
it's the greatest joy, it's the greatest joy and the greatest pain at the same time. Amen. Amen. Now, now and my hat is off to every every father and every father figure. Because remember, whether you've got a kid or not, there are so many guys out there that are fathers of so many people that don't even realize it. People are watching you and they're paying close attention to you. Amen. Amen. Now, now we're gonna we're still going on just keeping your focus, because I just I don't want to get past this keeping your focus. And of course, this can be a Father's Day message because this will be, a, hopefully, it'll be edifying fathers in the middle of all this. But there was a guy named Fred. Fred was unfortunate enough to be hit by a 10 ton truck. He landed up in the hospital in intensive care, and his best friend Morris came to visit him. Fred struggled to tell Morris, My wife Sally visits me three times a day. She's so good to me. Every day she reads to me at my bedside. She, he said, really, why does she read? She said, my insurance policy. <laughs> <laughs> Get your Bible out and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Ain't God good? All the time. Amen. This was something that started a couple weeks ago. I was actually praying and I was, I was saying, Lord... We just need something to help us get a kickstart, to get going again, to get up and move forward. You know, with all these deaths, you know, I was talking to somebody just yesterday, in just a matter of a few months, we lost, first we lost our oldest member, Sister Kathleen, in a matter of weeks, we lost Sister Mary, who was our next oldest member, and then uh, did Sister Kathleen's funeral on, um, Sister, I mean, Mary's funeral on Saturday, then my own daughter's funeral on Sunday, she died, and then Brother Billy died, and we've had other guys in the community die, and now Sister Dorothy, she is... She's having a rough time of it right now. She's at a nursing home. So, so there's been a, been a lot of lot of stuff going on in the last few months. And I know everybody else's life, there's always something going on. But sometimes you have that time where more than usual stuff happens. Amen? Amen. You have that time where, where, where extraordinary things happen in the reverse. Not extraordinary good, but extraordinary bad. You're trying to figure out how to get, you back, get yourself back up to kick yourself kickstart yourself to get going again. So, so this is where this comes from. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Stand for the reading of the word. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 13. Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended. I haven't arrived yet. But there's one thing I do. Y'all say one thing. One thing. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I know, God, you're alive and well on the throne. Father, I know there's absolutely nothing impossible for you. There's nothing that you cannot do. We trust you right now, Father, to minister to all of us, God, in a very powerful way. Help us all, Lord, to get back that function to get back that want to, to get back that, get back on our feet and get that second wind and to, to move forward in you instead, not instead of moving backwards or instead of sitting still. Let us get back up on our feet in the middle of all this and know that you're God and you have all this under control. In the name of Jesus, we love you. And we praise your name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God is so, so, so good. Matter of fact, we're going to do something else right now. Y'all can sit right still while I do it. We're gonna do this. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna talk to our Father. We're gonna say the Lord's Prayer together. Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Now, 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 we're talking about keeping our focus. Every once in a while, we'll wind up getting in the rebuild mode. When we get in this rebuild mode, it's when God begins to take away the things that we were holding on to and to move the things out of the way that we were depending on because sometimes we get so dependent on things that we forget that God doesn't want us dependent on things. God wants us dependent on Him. And so, so the rebuild mode, yeah, God used the rebuild mode first to draw us out of complacency. We get so complacent that, well, it's just going to be this way and we got this and all, you know, everything's going to be hunky-dory and, and also to get us out, draw us out of collapse because when I say collapse, sometimes we get so complacent we even stop working for God. We just kind of go day by day, kind of go with the flow, go with the wind. If 
we're not careful, the devil has rocked us to sleep. And then he draws out of us a freshness. Once we get in this rebuild mode, now freshness can come out of us, and, and we ask him to start growing. I had to get that sign back in there because I love it. Let's do that again. Look, come here. Put it back. Do not touch. Not only will this kill you, it will hurt you the whole time you were dying. Don't touch that thing. Whatever that thing was for. Amen. Amen. So, the rebuild mode. Again, here it is. It's a dangerous time because we can lose sight of what God is doing. And, and we got to realize God's not pushing you down. God's not pulling the rug out from under your feet. God's not trying to damage you. But God is trying to keep you from being damaged. God is trying to keep you from getting in this complacency and, and do it in a place of do nothing. And, and he wants us not to lose focus ourselves on us because, listen, listen, what are we doing? We're not supposed to be discouraged now. This is the time of discovery. So here we go. Here it is. We start, we started in last week. Our focus is unlimited by you. Satan does not want us to understand or to realize the potential and the power and the position of an undivided focus. If we can get our mind, you know, you know, uh, I'm all going. It's so funny because sometimes I get playing and I just forget everything around me when I'm playing. And I didn't even know we were practicing, and I was just playing. I just kept playing, and they told me after we got through playing that DC was sitting here looking at me. He didn't quit playing. Brandon was still playing. I was playing. And DC take his hand. He's been like this back and forth with his guitar. <laughs> and I didn't even know what was going on. I was so undivided. I had my mind on God and on blessings and on what God was speaking to my heart at the time. You know, if we could get ourselves, you remember that, that we are supposed to have an undivided focus. We can find ourselves getting in the rebuild mode and doing something better than we've ever done in our entire life. Now, there's ten, ten things to focus on. Last week I went on two, and today I'm going to go on two, and then we're going to be able to go have some fun Father's Day stuff. Maybe in some ways they say, hey, say, have some fun Father's Day stuff. <laughs> Amen. Number one, God, listen carefully. I want y'all to listen to this very carefully because I think somebody really needs to hear this if you want to hear nothing else. God has called every one of us in here, and he has not got us to this place so he can drop us. Come on now. God has called everybody in this place, and he ain't got us to this place so that he can drop us and say, I'm through with you. I'll wipe my hands with you. I've got nothing else for you to do. God called you, and he's got you here not to drop you, but to pick you up. Praise the Lamb of God. Yeah. God wants to do something special in everybody's life. You know, all right, Philippians 1 and 6, the Amplified Version. I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. Think about this thing. The good work in you is God's. Amen. Anything good I do, I know God's got. Anything good I do, I know God's, God's working in this thing. You know, I, I can't even imagine, you know, uh, just like, again, these little bandages, uh, bandages these little armbands, you know, of course, I got on the one today that says God's got this, and on the other side that says either way I win. And, and in just the last two days, it seems like everywhere I go, I'm running into people with cancer and running into people that are sick and running into people that's got problems. And I think I've given out 10, 15, 20 of these in the last two days. I put it on, I step out of the car and walk right into somebody. And they'll look at it and they'll say, and they'll, and they'll say, wow, that's right, God's got this. And I'll say, well, here, and I'll give it to them. And I'll tell them about Bethany and I'll give it to them. And, you know, see, see, see God has not taken, look, Bethany, or Bethany's death was not the end of Bethany. It was not the end of Bethany speaking. It was not the end of Bethany's influence. Bethany seems to have done more now in such a way that she never could have done any other way. And I thank God for the influence of that 27-year-old girl. She may not be with us physically, but praise God, she's all over the place. Uh, yeah, I went to a restaurant with the, uh, where they were playing last night. And I went in there, and there was people in that restaurant. And I looked, and they had, they had God's got this and Team Bethany on all over the place. They raised their hand. I look, and I see that little bandage. I, I go to places, and I don't even know the people. I look on their arm, and they got a, a Team Bethany on their arm, or God's got this. Or I hear them say, God's got this. You know, or either way I win, it's just so amazing. God doesn't bring you here just to drop you because he's got something special for you. He began it and he will complete it. He is the mighty God. Somebody say mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. Say it again. Mighty God. Mighty God. All right. Secondly, first, he didn't call you here to drop you. 
This is a good area. See the church under construction? Are y'all under construction? Yeah, I put in another room right here. Y'all remember what I told you? I said, you know, I, I actually it's really slimmed down during Bethany's troubles and trying to get through her. I, I got where I couldn't exercise like I was doing, and I, I got kind of got kind of pudgy again, but I said, you know what? All this stuff's going on in this world today, I have decided to identify as skinny. I am trans slender. <laughs> Amen. Hey, yes, here we go. Look. Number two, he will build his church. The church is not a building. The church is us. Amen. Somebody say he's working on you. Working. He's working on me. Look, I love this. And I tell you, you are Peter. Greek which means Petros, a large piece of rock. And upon this rock, Greek, a huge piece of rock like Gibraltar. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal regions, shall not overpower it, uh, or to be strong into its detriment, or hold out against it. Remember last week, I showed you this, and I've been doing it all week. I hope you have too. Watch this. The gates is where the wise met, the city met, it's where the council met, it's where the city was governed, it's where the lawyers met, it's where the court was held, it's where there were civil matters, the punishment was dealt there, punishment was administered, uh, uh, but the thing about the gates where they're stationary, we always feel like the gates of hell are coming against us. No, the gates of hell are strongholds. And the strongholds are there. They're there to stop us from moving forward. Amen? That's what the gates do. They stop us from moving forward. They're a stronghold in our life. But when Jesus saw, when John saw Jesus from out of Hamas, he said, I was he that's dead, but now I'm alive. And behold, I have the keys. Amen. To death, hell, and the grave. Amen. So look, let me tell you something. It's time to start kicking some doors down and move forward. Amen. Amen. Lay them back and let the devil keep you all tied up in a stronghold. Step up forward and let God do something special in your life. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank him for what he does. Get ready. Number three. Oh, I love this one. Woo! Look at that. He will uphold you with his righteous right hand. See that hand in the fire? Why? He did not promise to deliver you from the fire, but he did promise to walk through it with you. Come on now. That's right. He did not promise to deliver you from the fire, but he did promise to walk through it with you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were thrown in the fire, and the king looked in, he saw four men. Who was the fourth man? It was Jesus walking around in the fire with him. But Isaiah 43. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and that formed thee, O Israel. We've got to stop here and park for a while, because this is good stuff. Ready? I'm going to read it one more time, and then we're going to break her down. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall it be kindled upon thee. Now watch this. Let's that, just, just slow down and break it. Damn. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. Watch this. Here we go. He says first, he says, I have created thee, O Jacob. They were created, means literally to form, to breathe life into. Okay? So, so he was shaped. God said, I've shaped you. We've all, God's breathed life into us. Amen. Every last one of us in here, if we're breathing, we're breathing the air that God gave us. Amen. We're breathing life that God gave us. That's pretty cool. Okay? Somebody say it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Now get ready. This ain't so cool. Ready? Y'all say, this coming ain't so cool. This coming ain't so cool. <laughs> all right, y'all ready? And then he said, I formed thee, O Israel. I used to get so excited when I read that until I started seeing what it meant. And then I didn't get so excited anymore. Israel and Jacob were the same man. Jacob, God went, there it is, man, it's awesome. But Jacob wasn't in any position to really be used by God at the time. So God did something in his heart and in his life. And so he started going through some rough things. He got Laban. Uh, his brother came after him. There's all this stuff that was going on in his life because Jacob had some rough edges. Anybody here got any rough edges? More than rough edges, Jacob had some 
He had a lot of bent edges. He had some broke off edges. Amen. And so, so God said, in order for me to use you, Jacob, I'm going to have to squeeze you. Don't it feel good when you're on the wheel, the potter's wheel, and you think that oh, I'm a pretty vessel? And God goes, no, you're not. Come here. I squeeze you some more because I'm not sure you're exactly what I want you to be to do what I want to use you for. Amen. Well, I just plan on holding a couple of flowers up on the couch. No, that's not what you're going to do. I've called you to be a very powerful man of God. So in order to be a very powerful man of God, i got to put you through, through some powerful things. You know, uh, uh, I had a guy come up to me, and he just found out some things in his life that really, really was just made him distraught. He had never faced anything like this before. And, and he came up to me and says, I don't know what to do. He said, the craziest thing is they, they just made me deacon in my church. He said, now I'm taking to be deacon. Everything was wonderful. He said, I get in church and start serving God. And he said, I'm still looking at everything's looking good. And he says, then, then when I said, when they asked me to serve and start doing things around there, he, he said, things started changing. And when I took that deacon's position, he said, good Lord. He said, this hit me. And I won't go into what hit him, but he just goes into what hit me. And it would take the breath out of him. And I told him, well, I'm here to tell y'all. I said, the Lord told me way on back. When D.C. and Daniel's mama got sick, right after my mama got sick, buried my mama, and it wasn't just a few years I buried his mama. And all that stuff was going on, and I said, God, I don't understand this. I said, I told you I wanted to be used by you, but I'm kind of feeling abused. Well, come on. That's right. And God said, in order for me to use you greatly, I have to break you greatly. Wow. That'll make you shout, won't it? Before I can use you greatly, I gotta break you greatly. Because David Lynn, you get in your way so much. You put those thirteens in your mouth so much. You get in your way. You do things that you shouldn't. You listen. I got better ways to do it. You're doing it the odd way. I'm trying to show you a better way to get this done. I'm trying to make you more effective. So, Lord, to use you greatly, I got to break you greatly. And I told that to this person, my brother. I told my brother this, and he went, "Whoa!" And he said, "You know what? Now I understand, and I feel better. Although I'm still hurting from what's happening, I feel better." Watch this. God formed you. But if I was going to use you, there's that shaping. There's that squeezing. There's that remolding you. The, the vessel became mortal on the potter's wheel. Jeremiah 18. The vessel became mortal on the potter's wheel, but instead of throwing it away, he just took it and he just redone it right there on the wheel. He just fixed it back up and made it like he wanted it. Amen. So, 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 created, formed, and then redeemed. He said, I saved you. That meant he bought you back. So he created you. Along the way, you may have messed up. Along the way, things didn't go so well in your life. Maybe you're in your breaking mode. I don't know. But God says, don't worry about it because in the end, I got this. I got it. I got it. I got it. I look down here hundreds of times a day and I keep saying God's got this and I can see Bethany back there with back, back there where DC said. I see Bethany back there every day in my mind. I see her. I see her come walking in. I remember she come walking in with that pump on and she said, Daddy, this pump keeps making, this pump stinks. And she said, this pump, is this wound pump, she says, and it keeps making noises like I'm over here breaking the wind. I said, I'll tell you what you do, baby. Next time the thing goes, I said, you just go. And point at the person beside you. <laughs> so I don't know who she was sitting beside that day with that thing. And she went. <laughs> I saw that person go. <laughs> so we just make games out of things. We just play. We just play it all the time. We just all the time put up. And we play, but I see it every day. And I, and I just told somebody just a couple of days ago, I said, if I ever get faced with that kind of, that kind of, of whatever in my life, I want to have that same kind of attitude. God's got this either way I win. It's going to be okay. So now, so now, here we go. One more. And I've called you. I've 
summoned you for a purpose. So I've shaped you. I squeeze you. Everybody, everybody goes through this. Everybody. Look and say everybody. everybody. If you're going to be used by God, you're, you're born, you're shaped. You're squeezed. Life will squeeze the life out of you. Then, but he's there. He's paying for it. He's got you covered. And then he still calls you for a purpose. And that is so, so awesome. I mean, this is not necessarily the Father's Day message you came for, but praise God, it's here. Amen. And then we're at his place. We're safe. He said, I got you. I got you. I got you. And then finally, here it is. I love this. Disappointments are just God's way of saying, I've got something better. Can you say that? Disappointments are just God's way of saying, be patient, have faith, and trust God. You see, I'm telling you, sometimes we put too much faith in the wrong thing. We put too much faith in wrong wrong ideas and put too much faith in wrong areas and God says hold on, hold on I still going to use you, I still got something for you, I haven't dropped you I still got you, but in order for me to do what I want to do in your life, you're going to need a little bit more shaking, you're going to need a little bit more sandpaper, you're going to need a little bit more cutting on this side and cutting on that side, but you be patient, because I got something for you and it's better than you ever could imagine you may be disappointed now, but understand, there's something better coming. Somebody said, there's something better coming. <clears throat> y'all sound so enthusiastic. <laughs> y'all sound like y'all standing in line for a roof now. Come on. There's something better coming. Say it again. There's something better coming. All right. Watch this. There's more in store for your life and for your ministry. You know, uh, uh, if you look at the Bible, the Bible tells us in Hosea 10 and 12, it says to break up the foul of ground. Break up the, 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 the foul of ground that's within you. It says, seek the Lord, break up the foul of ground. You know what foul of ground is? I remember when I lived in Pamela County, when I lived in Merritt, uh, we had fields all over everywhere. We were just in the middle of fields. And I remember... Every year, when it come harvest time, it was always so cool. I just loved it. Man. I love the smell of stuff and smell all the what was going on, the growing and the, 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 the corn and whatever was out of there, the beans. And, and, and I would watch every year, and I didn't quite understand at the time. I talked to Daddy. I said, Daddy, I was, well, I was little. I looked out there, and, and they had harvested. And I mean, it was just a cradle of big fields. And they had harvested everything, and it was just bent over, bent over uh, corn, uh, uh, corn stalks bent over and crushed, and there may be a couple of corn cobs here and there, and they would come through, and they would, go out, they would just devour it. Kind of like my brothers at the dinner table, kind of like D.C. and Daniel at the dinner table, just devour it. <coughs> and I'd climb over there and play, and I would remember how hard that ground was. There was roots, there was stubble, <coughs> There was pieces of evidence from the former harvest, but the land was dead. Listen to what I just said. There was evidence of a previous harvest, but the land was dead. When I was young, how many like going when, 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 the, when the sand is cool? And you're hot and you go barefoot and you go step in that cool sand, how good it felt. To get on your feet and get in your toes. But on that, that ground, after it was harvested, it was hard. It was almost like calloused. You could say the land was calloused over. Bits and pieces of corn and stalks and just calloused over. You could go down and pick up pieces and it'd just be pieces of dirt. And it'd be big old clunks of dirt. We got in there and play with them and throw them at each other. I read this scripture. And as I read the scripture and I began to look at it, it took me back to my childhood. Because Father Brown is that ground that I'm talking about. Father Brown is ground that has evidence of a harvest, but it's crusted over, it's hard, it's calloused, it's got broken pieces, it's just terrible. 
I remember every year when I was a little boy, I couldn't wait for the, for the, yeah, they were the disc, and they would get the disc, the big old trousers would get the disc, and they'd come through and they would disc it up. And when they disc it up, you could smell it again, it smelled wonderful. And when they disc it up, I could go right there and run again because it was soft. And, and you, all the evidence of the previous harvest was actually gone because within a matter of days, there was hills planted, and in the hills, there was more crops planted. And then the crops, within, within weeks, the crops would be up where you could see them coming up, and I got to watch them grow, and it used to excite me. The scripture. I asked my daddy one time, I said, Daddy, uh, why, why do they, because my daddy was a farmer when he was young, I said, Daddy, uh, why do they have to go up there and cut up all this ground? Why don't you just go ahead and throw some more stuff out there? He said, Son, that, that ground's not good for anything right now. That ground, for all practical purposes, is dead. He said, because it's cold and it's callous and it's got all this stuff in the way. It's got remnants from the, from the first harvest. It's in the way. And says, the farmers have to go out with a disc and they have to cut it up. They don't just plow it up. They cut it up with that disc. And when they cut up that, that, that ground, then they reshape it and get it ready with mounds and then they re, replant in it. Again, plow the ground. Hosea was talking to some people that had just returned from captivity. These are people that in their hearts they had remnants of a previous harvest. But now they're cold and they're calloused and they've got broken stalks and they've got scattered corn and their heart is crusted over. And Hosea says, it's time to seek the Lord. Break up, disc it, hair it, the foul of ground that is cold and calloused. Still has remnants, but that's all. <coughs> you may every now and then see a little stalk come up, but that's it because the ground is, for all practical purposes, has, caught, has become useless. Am I speaking to somebody today? That if you can see in your heart, it'd be like that fallow ground. It'd be cold, stalks, remnants of a previous harvest. Oh, there's, there's proof there that you worked for God. There's proof there that you did something. But it's cold, calloused, rubbed over. You're not even hearing from God anymore. Like you used to. You're not as excited as you used to be. You're not even looking for the harvest. Because the ground, again, your heart is calloused over. God says, if you're ready for me to do something in your life, and you're in that rebuild mode, somebody in rebuild mode definitely has to break up that fallow ground. How do you do it? What do you do? Well, let's just go a little further here. Let's just take a little deep. This is, this is good stuff, isn't it? Amen. Somebody say amen. 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 Okay. Y'all wait there so no one will get a picture. Okay. Somebody read that out loud. Say it one more time, I love it. You are reading this. Isn't that cool? Amen. You know, I thought about going to the funeral home. I already asked because I go to the funeral home, but when they set up a camera, and I preach my own funeral. When they roll out a coffin, and let me just stand in front of the coffin and preach. And the first thing I'm gonna say is, if you see me up here, I'm actually not here, I'm down there. <laughs> well not in hell, man. <laughs> <laughs> Down there. <laughs> Woo! Maybe that's not such a good idea. I might take that one back. All right. So, if, if you're reading this, God still has a plan and a purpose for your life. So here we go. You ready? I wrote down the scriptures, so you ain't got to look them up. This is why it reminds you stir up. Rekindle the embers up and the flame and keep burning the gracious gift of God that in fire 
desire to see you by the means of laying on of my hands with the elders of your ordination. Stir it up. God didn't say, I'm going to stir it up. God didn't say that somebody else stir it up. God said, through Paul, to Timothy. Timothy was having a hard time. He was a young man. He had a big responsibility. He was taking, he was taking over from Paul, and Paul went around there. Paul, he goes somewhere and get locked up. And so there's Timothy trying to take care of all these churches, and they thought he was too young, didn't know what he was doing. They were always beating him up over it. And he said, Timothy, you let your heart get calloused. You let all this stuff take you down. You have to trust God and break up that foul ground that is within you. So watch this. Get ready. You may feel that your purpose is dead and buried. Why not you listen carefully? There's a difference in burying and planting. When something's dead, you plant it. I wish I had a seed. Anybody got a seed in their, anybody got a seed in their pocket? Man. If I had a seed, I'd love this here, but this would be my seed. They found seeds in the pyramids. They were thousands of years old. They took those seeds and they buried them. And they grew. God's given you so many seeds. If you throw a seed on fallow ground, it's probably just going to stay there. It may come up a little bit. It may be a little bit of sunshine and hope, but it's not going to do good. But if you break up that file of ground and put that seed, no matter how old it may seem, no matter how old, how bad you think, oh, God can't use me because he gave me that promise years ago and I don't even feel it. I don't even see it. If the pyramids, if you take seeds out of the pyramids and plant them, don't you know if God's given you a seed, a thought, a hope, a promise, you break up that foul ground of your heart and let it go down deep and watch what happens. You know what? There's a lot of things in here you think is dead and buried. It's not dead and buried. You need to think about that and say, God, this is no longer buried. This is planted. I'm putting it back in the right way. I'm putting it back in and foul I'm going to take the foul ground I'm going to break it up and I'm going to watch you do something special. Watch this. What looks like an end, so many times, is only a beginning. You know, I told somebody just the other day, they were, they were, they were talking about things that were happening in their life, and they, they were saying, I don't know how we're going to get through this, and, and, and what is God allowing, and I can't believe this is happening. And I told them, I said, here's what you got to do, is you got to get your mindset changed. You're looking, and you're seeing this stuff as a stop sign. Change your mind. This is not a stop sign. It's a speed bump. A stop sign is there to stop you, to keep you from going forward. A speed bump there to slow you down so you will look around you and be cautious of what's happening around you. God's saying, I just want you to be cautious. I want you to see what's happening. Because remember, God's got something special. DC, come on up here. You have to keep your focus through the pain. Keep your focus through the pain to get those gains. I remember when I hurt my leg a couple of years back and, and when I tore the muscle in my leg and, and I went through nine weeks of physical therapy and the, and, and the, the physical therapist told me, said, said, I know this hurts, but you got to turn toward the pain and you got to stretch. I know that muscle hurts. I know that leg hurts. I know that knee is killing you. But if you don't do what I tell you, you're going to freeze up. And if you freeze up, it's over. You got to keep your focus through the pain to get those gains. This is how we've been in the last couple of weeks. But there's no way to improve on it. Don't focus on the problems. Because if you focus on your problems, all it does is bring pain. And the greater the pain gets, soon there's nothing but panic. 
kind of watch it. Focus instead on the promises. Because when you focus on the promise, something special happens. Then you begin to realize there's power, that you're not fighting in the corner, that it's not over. And you get peace in your heart. There's still a lot of things I look back at now. I'm still waiting for God to raise it up. I'm still waiting for God to see that seed grow. But I have decided to quit putting periods where God put a comma.
And Lord, help me to break up any foul ground that is in my heart. In the name of Jesus, this day is yours, and I thank you for it. Amen. Give Lord a hand clap of praise. Everybody just come to pray to the altar open. You want to come up and pray to the altar open. It's not a problem. And we're going to pray for a friend, too. Bless our daddies. 
somebody's here that doesn't have any children with them, bless them, all right? To be your standing daddy for right now. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for all the fathers in this place. Bless them, anoint them, use them. Whatever they need in their life, God, bring it to them. Show them comfort, show them compassion, and we know that you're going to do it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen. 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 We're going to put it on Facebook this week. Tell people we're going to start that, that uh, therapy. Or, I, I don't want to call it therapy because then they're thinking we're doing something crazy. We're going to start. I don't even know what to be in there. How about that? That'll be a good thing. Be in there. On Tuesday nights, starting in about, we're going to put it on Facebook. It'll be about two weeks. We're going to start the, the, this be in there. It's actually called Mindfulness Cognitive Behavior. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. We're not going to call it that because that's a mouthful and everybody thinks where's God and all this. God's in all of this. He's got to understand. So we're just going to start being there. How about that? We'll think another name will be to be there in a couple weeks. On Tuesday nights, it'll last approximately eight weeks. It will help you if you're having problems with depression, if you're having problems with PTSD, having problems with CTSD. Uh, it'll help you with this. Y'all know the difference between PTSD and CTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder is usually from a car wreck or maybe a rape victim or, or you, you witnessed a terrible crime or a murder. You might have PTSD. Uh, if you're overseas and you're fighting, you can fight for, for 18 months and never get PTSD and just see one thing. Your buddy get blown up beside you and then it's over. The PTSD takes over. It takes one event, one event for PTSD. CTSD is complex traumatic stress disorder. That's usually a child that's been abused, a spouse that's been abused. They've had constant, constant pain and constant abuse. Those people, it's CTSD. They're, even though they're similar, they're definitely different, the causes are different, and there's some different ways you handle it. But what we're going to do is, this is not a cure-all, but over the, next, over the next eight weeks, you will find relief. How many would like to find some relief? Okay. So, starting in a couple of weeks, we're going to put it in Facebook on our church page. We'll put it up on the sign out front. Again, I'm not sure what to call it yet, but, but it's going to be awesome, and you're going to find some relief. It may, it may not cure it, but it will definitely help it. I'll say it, it, I'll say it'll help you by more than 50%. That's just on the low side. I think it'll be a lot higher than that, but it'll really help you. So, so come on. We're going we're gonna to let God, we're going to do it through God. We're not going to do it through some crazy mess. It's going to be scriptures, and it's going to be Christian-based, and you're going to like this, and you're going to learn a lot about God in all of this. Because God is the master of psychology. He's the master physician, which means he's the master physician for your brain, for your spirit, for your body. So God is the master physician, and, and it's going to be awesome. Amen? And tell your friends, because some people have been telling me they want to know when it's getting ready to start. I can't remember who even asked. So, so, tell them, and when you see it on the sign, we'll know for sure. It'll be on Tuesday nights, and it's informal on Tuesday nights. We're over there in that room. We got cookies and popcorn, and we, we eat and, 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 and do all this stuff, too. It's been really, really awesome. But not this week, but it's coming up. Amen? All hearts and minds clear? Amen. Brother Doug, you dismiss us in prayer, please. Father, we just thank you for loving us, for giving us everything that we need, not necessarily everything that we want. And Lord, I just pray that you would continue to be with us, guide us like a like the good father that you are. Be with all those that are father figures to others, strengthen them and help them to do what is right in your eyes. May your will also be done in our lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen.